Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Uh, Commonwealth called their first witness. Officer Sawyer Bruce, please. Officer Bruce, if you would please come forward and be sworn. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please have a seat and answer the questions of Ms. Biggers and then Mr. Foreman. Good afternoon, officer. Could you please state your name and place of employment for the jury? I'm Officer Sawyer Bruce. I work for the Radcliffe Police Department, and I've worked there since September of last year when I was initially hired. Okay. And uh, so you've recently gone through the police academy? Yes, ma'am, I have. When, when, when would, I'm sorry, when did you begin the academy? I began the academy in September of last year, and I completed it in February this year. Can you tell the jury a little bit about the academy, uh, what it is, what you do, how you split focus between different um, things that you might encounter as a police officer? Uh, there's many different categories of everything we learned. Obviously, it's a very, very wide range of things you need to know for this career. We have the physical fitness division where we, we have PT nearly every day, our physical training, running, exercising. We have different sections, such as defensive tactics also, but more than all, we have uh, classroom time over just the laws and statutes of the Kentucky Rise statutes of the laws of this state. And we also have a 40-hour course of the DUI section where we learn about field sobriety tests and how to use the intoxilizer instrument, that both the 5,000 and the 8,000. And we have firearms training, driving training, all just a very wide range of things we need to learn. And you completed that program, correct? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. When, you when, you, when you finished the academy and um, were given a uniform and they said, here's a car, go, go out and do things, were you on your own No, I, not for quite a while, actually. Okay. How long did you have someone, a training officer with you? For 14 weeks, I had another training officer um, a different one every three weeks. There's veteran officers that were with us, just teaching us and observing us as we went. The first um, 12 weeks is whenever we were instructed and also observed at the same time and evaluated. We got evaluated every day, every single call that we went on, everything that we did, every interaction with every person, arrest, citation, crime report, anything that we did, we got evaluated on. In the final two weeks, week 13 and 14, so whenever the training officers no longer would help us, they only they made us make our own decisions completely and just evaluated our choices at, at that time and gave a score accordingly to that. And on March, um, on March 21st of this year, you were still in that early phase where the officer was assisting you, giving guidance throughout the process of any investigation, correct? Yes, I was in the second phase with the now detective, Mike Berry. And he was just an officer at that point? Yes, he was one of the training officers. Were there any times or instances during your training period where you may have had to do something on your own because the officer was unavailable, the supervising officer? Or, I mean, outside of clerical work, I mean, you know, if you're filling out a case report or paperwork or a citation, other than that, was an officer with you every single time that you were conducting an investigation? Yes, there wasn't a time that they weren't there observing us because their job was to evaluate us every day on everything we did. The only time he, um, that my training officers wouldn't have been there if I was typing a long report or something, they wouldn't have to watch me type the entire thing. They would just evaluate it at the very end. Okay, that makes sense. So were you working for the Radcliffe Police Department early morning about a little before 3 a.m. on March 21st of 2015? Yes, ma'am. And who was your supervising officer at that time? My, tra the my training, training officer, officer yes. was Mike Berry. Mike Berry, okay. Um, did you have reason that day to come into contact with Joel Van Sleitman? Yes, ma'am, I did. And do you recognize him? Yes, I do. Can you please indicate him for the jury? He's sitting over at the table next to Larry Foreman in the military uniform. Um, what was the nature of your interaction with him on March 21st? Um, it began whenever I was using stationary radar with Detective Mike Berry. 
Um, I was sitting just next to a wall on 31W, just um, south of Bullion Boulevard, if you know where that is. And I was just running stationary radar. What does that mean, stationary radar? It's Well, we have moving radar and stationary radar. Stationary radar is just conducted. It's a mode that we turn the radar on whenever we are just sitting still and waiting for uh, traffic to come through, just to observe that traffic. Okay. Um, and you said you were at the intersection or near Dixie Highway and Bullion Boulevard? Yes, I was just south of that. Okay. And is that in Harding County? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, had the radar, the stationary radar machine that you were discussing, had it been calibrated properly uh, prior to use? Yes, I checked the calibration the way I was trained to. Okay. And what does that involve, just the checks to make sure that it's working properly? Yes, um, the checks that we do as officers every day is that we take the tuning forks that each are supposed to register on the radar at 35 miles per hour and then the other at 65 miles per hour. It checks to make sure that the re radar is reading the correct speed of something that emits those types of waves that it reads and that night or I guess the prior night whenever I checked the calibration on the 35 mile per hour tuning fork it read 35 miles per hour and on the 65 mile per hour tuning fork it read 65 miles per hour as it should have. Now when you say that you checked the calibration um, the night before you're talking about the same shift just a few hours before yes. midnight versus a few hours after midnight. Yes about 9 45 p.m. the night before. Um, so you observe, while, while, while using the stationary radar, you observe Mr. Van Sleitman driving. Yes. Um, what, was, what caused you to make contact with him? Well, after he exited the Bullion Boulevard ramp and was going straight on Dixie Highway, which would have been heading south towards my direction, I saw the vehicle. First, we are trained to observe a vehicle moving at a high rate of speed and then use the radar to confirm that, not based solely off of the radar. And I saw that his vehicle was moving fast, and then I saw that, that vehicle on the radar was registering at 72 miles per hour. And what is the zone, the speed zone? It is 55 miles per hour on Dixie Highway in that section. So because of the speed, you initiated a traffic stop? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you tell us about what happened then? After I made the traffic stop, um, I caught up to Mr. Van Slaven. I caught up to the vehicle and I turned my lights on and we pulled over south of Bullion Boulevard on 31 but north of Preston Street. It's probably close to a half mile down the road maybe and then after um, I had the vehicle stopped I approached the vehicle and I made contact with Mr. Van Sleitman on the driver's side of the vehicle. And there I first made contact with him he was wearing, he had a hood up over his head and covering his face. I couldn't, he handed me a license, a license and uh, proof of insurance immediately as I requested. But there was a hood over his face and I could not even see if it was the same person that was on the license. So I asked him to remove the hood so that I could see that, verify who he is on the license. And after he took his hood down, that's when I detected the odor of alcohol, and an alcoholic beverage on his breath. I could hear it whenever he was speaking to me, or smell it whenever he was speaking to me. And I saw his, that he had red bloodshot eyes, and he was, before he even took his head off, he was talking in a slow, kind of slurred manner. I'm sorry, Judge, did, I, did I do that? It's been going on all morning. I'm not exactly sure what's... what's I'm going to try this. Um, I'm sorry to distract you. Um, so you tell me a little bit. How how was the hood up around his face? Was this was it one of the hoods with a string in it? It was it was from a he was wearing a black hoodie, a black zip up hoodie. It looked like, but he had the hood up and he was not turning towards me. He was facing just straight forward as he looked for his license and insurance and other documents and it was about coming about right here I suppose and I could not not see his face at all I couldn't verify who the driver was okay. um, so but you observed the um, the speech problems and the eyes just once once he took it off yes okay so based upon your observation of those things what did you do next 
after I observed all those things, first I went back to my vehicle, asked him to remain in the vehicle. I went back to my vehicle and ran his license just through our dispatch records and everything in NCIC, just to verify that his license was in force and correct as it should be. It was not suspended or anything. It was in order as it should have been. And then after I ran those records and made everything, made sure everything there was okay, I went back up to the vehicle and I asked Mr. Van Sleitman to step out of the vehicle because of what I had observed, all the detectors of an alcoholic beverage being present in the system. So you asked him to step out of the vehicle. Did he comply? Yes, he stepped right out just as I asked him. He was following <coughs> orders. And where was Officer Barry during uh, your interaction while Mr. Van Sleitman was still in the vehicle? He, for some of it, he was on the other side of me, um, the passenger side of the vehicle, just observing. It's, we like to see whatever we can going on inside the vehicle at all times, just for safety. He was just on the other side of the vehicle. And then after I asked Mr. Van Sleitman to come out of the vehicle, he was just standing right back there with me just observing me. So when you ask him to exit the vehicle, where do you go in relation to your vehicle and his vehicle? Uh, we were in between both of them. And tell me a little bit about the area where you did the stop. What, what's the surface like? Is it concrete? It's paved, yeah, asphalt pavement. Okay. There's asphalt. Um, what about the, the, is it flat or is there, are there some hills or undulations in the, in the? There's a, there's a slight incline, very slight incline going um, up towards the south side, the south direction. And it's night outside, right? Yes. It's what, a little bit before three in the morning? Yes. Um, uh, tell me some other things about the weather though. Was it um, a clear night? Was it raining? It was clear, it, okay. no rain or anything. Um, once he is out of the vehicle, what do you do next? After I'm out of the vehicle, I uh, told him that I had just a standard a few standard tests for him that I put people through that you know show these signs on traffic stops and the first one that I told him I had was called the horizontal gaze nystagmus um, or I'm looking for nystagmus in the eyes which is a sort of shakiness when I have them follow my finger and I'll just watch for certain clues I put them through that test let's talk about let's talk about clues what are clues uh, the clues, we look for certain clues on our field sobriety test, and we look for a certain number of clues, brings about a certain probability that someone is impaired under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And is this uh, training that you received at the academy? Yes, I received so it. Is this standard across the state for law enforcement officers? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The way that you do the, the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, um, is, are, is there a standard way to perform that test and did you learn that at the academy? Yes. Okay. Um, and tell me about Mr. Van Slyden's performance on that test. Uh, whenever I began my first test, the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, I first always ask, is there any medical conditions I need to know about? And I was informed there were none. And whenever I began the first test, I made sure I did the medical check of just make sure that there was a convergence in the eyes whenever I moved my finger closer. And then I began the test. Whenever I began the test, I moved my finger from side to side to look at the motion of his pupils on my finger to look for smooth pursuit. And he had lack of smooth pursuit what there. What does that mean, smooth pursuit? Smooth pursuit is whenever your eyes are following a moving object from one side to another that they just move smoothly. But whenever someone's under the influence of alcohol, or alcohol is present in their system, you can see their eyes do not move smoothly. They jump more so along, like there's gaps in the way they move. And I, I think you said this, I just wanna make sure. You, you, you did ask him if there were any other medical issues? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so one thing you're looking for is a smooth pursuit. Um, when you're doing this, how far out do you go? I go out um, about on smooth pursuit, is that what you're asking? Yes. I go out about 6 to 12 inches to the, to the side of their head, but I'm 6 to 12 inches away this way also. And that's standardized? Yes. Okay. Um, so but beyond smooth pursuit, what else are you looking for? I also look for nystagmus at maximum deviation, and that means I 
instead of just moving my finger along the whole time once I have it out to the side of their head where their pupil is looking completely as far to the side as they can while keeping their head straight if um, I look for if there's just resting or just nystagmus at maximum deviation and whenever they're looking at the side their pupils will just start to kind of flutter and bounce right there and what did you observe for Mr. Van Sleitman on that test on that test he showed nystagmus and I held my finger out to the side and asked him to watch for a minimum of four seconds and I observed nystagmus in both directions. So what, and then what else do you look for in the HGN test overall? We talked about smooth pursuit, we've talked about the, the um, nystagmus at maximum deviation. What else are you looking for? The third clue we look for is onset of nystagmus prior to 45 degrees. This one is where we just begin right in the center and then we ask them to follow our finger and we just move it very, very, very slowly. And then we look to see if there's any nystagmus at moving at that slow speed before we reach 45 degrees. And if so, then that's another indicator. But these two clues were not present on Mr. Van Sleitman. So we've talked about clues. How many clues are there possible in the HGN test? There are six clues possible. Is that six for each eye or three for each eye? That's three for each eye. So how many did you observe in Mr. Van Sleitman? I observed four clues. And what were they? I observed the uh, lack of smooth pursuit in the right eye and the lack of smooth pursuit in the left eye. And then I observed the maximum deviation nystagmus in the right eye and the maximum deviation nystagmus in the left eye also. Okay. Um, did your training at all um, tell you any, uh, I guess, statistics about the reliability of the HGN test? Yes, the HGN test is the most accurate of the three tests and it shows that if four clues or more are detected that it's an 87 percent probability that the person is under the influence of alcohol. Is it 87? 87 percent. Or thereabout. Okay. Um, all right, so that was the HGN test, and you, it seems like it indicated to you that there was some, perhaps some impairment there, um, but did you stop with that test or did you do more? Uh, after that, I conducted, I conducted the walk and turn test. Okay, and what is that? It's where I instruct the, uh, the subject to stand in a certain manner with his arms down at his sides, standing straight up, with his right foot in front of his left foot, making heel-toe contact, and then I ask him to hold that position and not begin until I tell him to, and then I will give him further instructions and then tell him when to begin. I'll ask him, did you have a question? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I ask them to hold that position until I tell them to begin the test because I have further instructions for them, and then I also observe their balance during, while they're holding that position from heel-toe. And then, how is it that you explain how the test should be performed? What's that? I'm how sorry. is it that you explain to someone how the test should be performed? Uh, while they're holding that position, I explain to them, well, first I show them the position they need to be in. I do it myself, and I have them copy. Do you mind standing up and showing us? Absolutely. Jack, can you come out here? Just in front of the witness stand would be fine. All right. Or actually, um, well, what, what are then? What are the rest of the instructions? All right. While we're holding that position, I will tell them, "All right, you're going to hold that position until I tell you to begin." And whenever I tell you to begin the test, then you are going to take nine heel toe steps. And from starting in this position, counting the first step is one. It should be like this. And your arms at your sides. One. Three and take 
take nine steps back and not stopping at any point in the test and make sure to make field to field toe contact during the test and not raise your arms. Yeah, see, thank you. When you were explaining that, um, I, I noticed that you just did three steps. You said one, two, three, and then, and then continue to nine. Continue nine. Did you just do the three when you were showing? Yes. Okay. So what you showed us is how you explained the test to him? Yes. Okay. Tell me about his performance on this test. On this test, I observed two different clues whenever I instructed him to take, and during the instructions, to take nine steps forward, make the improper, or make the turn, and then take nine steps back. He began the test in the position that I instructed him to at the right time, and he took nine steps forward, and then he stopped on his ninth step, and during that time he looked at me, he looked up, and he asked um, he, that he was unsure what to do now whenever I had already asked him if he was, did you understand the instructions before we began? And uh, he asked, I told him just to complete the test as I had instructed him. And then at that time, instead of turning back around, he failed to make the turn and he just took nine more steps forward until he was almost to the very back of his vehicle. Um, so that was, you said there were two clues that you observed then on that test? Yes. Okay. That was the improper number of steps and the improper turn. Um, and so at that point, did you stop doing field sprite tests or did you do more? No, I continued on with the third test I always do. I always do them in the same order. I like to have a routine that is the same every time to make sure I do it the best way I can. And the next test I did was the one leg stand test. Okay. And what is that? Um, it is where I instruct the subject to uh, stand with their feet together and their arms down at their sides, and then I instruct them to count out loud 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and just continue on until I say stop. During that time, I ask them to raise either foot of their choosing off the ground and then point, have the raised foot about six inches off the ground with their toe pointed and keep their arms down at their sides, not to hop, and not to use their arms for balance, and just hold that position until I say stop. And then I timed him for 30 seconds, and I observed what clues I did during that test. What did you observe? I observed one clue whenever he put his, whenever beginning the test, he put his foot down twice during, before we hit the three second mark. Um, so at this point, um, Officer or Detective Barry is still with you, um, observing your, I guess, administration of these tests, right? Yes, ma'am. Based upon his performance of the on the field sobriety test, what did you do? Um, I well, before taking him into custody, placing him under arrest for DUI, I also used a PBT to check for the presence of alcohol. Um, so, based upon all these things, you said you, you placed him under arrest? Yes. Um, and, let's see, do you know what time you first made contact with him? I made contact with him at about 2.48 a.m. Okay. And so, you arrested him, and where did you take him? I took him back to the Radcliffe Police Department. What did you do there? After we got to the Radcliffe Police Department, I took him inside. Um, I took whatever property he had on him at the time, just as I do with everyone logged his property, make sure that it was not lost or anything. And um, then I began writing up a citation. And during this time, I read him the implied consent warning form that we do for anyone that we charge with DUI, explaining to him the conditions if he complies with the test or if he doesn't, if he refuses a test, his right to talk to an attorney, if he will submit to the test, his right to receive his own test at his own expense by some other physician as sort of like an independent, his own independent test. Okay. And is this form in writing? Yes.
We may. Matthew, be careful with the ink on the exhibit sticker. Uh, okay. But does this look familiar to you? No objection, by the way, Judge. Thank you. Yes. And what is that? That is the implied consent warning that I read to uh, Mr. Van Sleitman that night. Okay. And does it have his signature on it? Yes, it does. Does it have your signature on it? Yes, it does. Can you explain to us how it is that you go through that form with him before asking him to sign? Yes, I just began at the very beginning of it. I fill in his name, his information, his license number, the citation number, his social security number to verify that it is for the right person. And then I read in the very first thing on here, I'll read it to you all. During the next 20 minutes, you are not allowed to eat, drink, smoke, or place anything in your mouth or nasal passages. Do you have anything in your mouth at this time? At this time, he answered no, or I wouldn't have continued on with the observation period. And then I explained to him, would you like me to go ahead and read all of the, of sure, the conditions of if you were to comply with the test or refuse the test? I will be requesting that you submit to a test of your breath, blood, or urine, or any combination of these tests. If you refuse to submit to any test which I request, your refusal may be used against you in court as evidence of your violation of KRS 189A.010, and your driver's license will be revoked. If you are convicted of KRS 189A.010, your refusal will subject you to a mandatory minimum jail sentence, which is twice as long as the mandatory minimum jail sentence that would be imposed if you submit to all requested tests. You will also be unable to obtain a hardship license. The results of any test taken may be used against you in court as evidence of your violation of KRS 189A.010. If the results are 0 0.15 or above and you are convicted of violating KRS 189A.010, you'll be subject to a jail sentence that is twice as long as the mandatory minimum jail sentence that would be imposed if the results are less than that of 0 0.15. If you submit to all tests which I request, you have the right to obtain a test of your blood performed at your own expense by a qualified person of your choosing within a reasonable time of your arrest. And uh, let's see, so you asked him to sign this form, or you asked him to sign the form if he was consenting, correct? Yes, in multiple places for multiple different things. And did he things. sign in each place appropriately? Yes, he did. Did he request his own test independently of yours? No, he did not. He, I asked him if he was going to request his own test by his, a physician of his own choosing, and he said no. Any objection? No, Judge. All right, without objection, enter into evidence as Commonwealth Exhibit 1, the implied consent form. So after you read him the implied consent, uh, well, let me ask this. Uh, what machine did you use to perform the intoxilizer test? I use the Intoxilizer 5000 instrument. And are you certified in operating that machine? Yes, I am. Were you certified on that Can you identify this for me? Yes, this shows my certification on the Intoxilizer 5000 that I obtained at the Department of Criminal Justice Training in Richmond, Kentucky. Thank you. I'm welcome to introduce this as Exhibit 2. No objection. Right. Without objection, uh, entering into evidence is Commonwealth Exhibit 2. So while you're filling out or the implied consent form, um, uh, are you watching him, observing him, making sure that he's not doing anything that would in, in, interfere with the test? Yes, I just make, I always have them handcuffed to just the benches we have in our squad room and directly next to our squad room um, by a doorway with no door, if, if you will, is the room where we have the intoxilizer and he was sitting on the benches directly outside that room. Tell me, about, tell me a little bit about your training with the intoxilizer machine itself. Um, how, how, when you walk up to it and you know that you're gonna perform a test, um, what do you do? How do you make sure it's ready? Uh, to make sure that it's in proper working order and everything, I always check for three things. I check to make sure that the tube 
that the subject blows into is warm to the touch as it is made to be. I also check to make sure that the fluids on the back of the machine are bubbling the solution or it checks for the calibration of alcohol and make sure it's reading the, the, in the correct way and that solution was also bubbling and then I make sure that the the words and numbers across the screen are scrolling and the machine's not frozen up and it was all in proper working order at that time. Yes, it is. This is the one located, the only intoxilizer we have, we had at the time at RPD. That's when you had at the time. Um, what is the date on the first set of maintenance records that I handed to you? This date says 3-18-2015. And does the test indicate, or does the uh, form indicate whether the machine was in proper working order? Yes, it says it is in tolerance. First, identify that it is in fact the machine that we're discussing here today. Oh, sorry. Yes, it is. Right, may we approach. I'm not sure that this is the correct witness to enter these exhibits because he's not the one who inspected the machine. He's, he just knows that the machine was the one that he used. He never was. Dean Sack was the one that he, she's really supposed to be entering these exhibits through, not the officer. Because he's not familiar with these records and he's never seen them before. They're so certified they're records. records. Right. Not that copies of the certified, but... Right. We're, we're treating them as certified. Right. Well, I mean, they are self-authenticating and I previously allowed that to come in without any testimony concerning it at all, other than because they... Uh, he's just not qualified, that's all I'm saying, Judge. Yes, I, I guess I tend to agree in that I don't know that we need this testimony from the officer, so I'll, I'll, su I'll sustain the objection. Thank you. On the machine, um, you said that you were looking for the bubbling solution, scrolling display, and that the tube was warm to touch, right? Yes, ma'am. And uh, were all of those things present at that time? Yes, all those things were present. So, do you believe the machine to be in working order? Yes, I do. Uh, tell me about then exactly how the test is administered to an individual. Um, if we are, I guess, starting from um, your observation period, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Um, whenever I begin that 20-minute observation period, I write the time on the breath test slip that goes into the intoxilizer to ensure just exactly when I begin the observation. And I use the same time that is on the intoxilizer machine so that I ensure that it is, we're going off of that time for the entire test. For the observation period, for all the calibration checks, for the subject test sample, and for the end calibration check again, the air blanks. And I wrote down my observation time on my breath oh, test. Oh, what that was? I believe it was at 3.17 a.m. Okay. So, um, during, so at 3.17, the ob observation time, the observation period began. Did you observe in the wait period after that, the defendant do anything that would interfere with that test? No, I did not. Were you in the room with him the entire time? I was in the room next to him, but I had... You had visual... I did not keep my eyes on him the entire time, but I knew where he was. I knew that he was restrained to the bench. I knew that he had no access to anything else. But did I, he indicate to you that anything had happened that would have interfered with the test? No. Okay. So let's talk then about the test. Um, let's... Uh, I'm sorry. If I could judge... I Uh, can you 
Bobby? Yes, this is the breath test slip from that night. And how do you know it is the test for Mr. Van Sleitman? It has Mr. Van Sleitman's name on it as the subject. It has my name on it and the agency as the operator's name and operating agency. It has the citation number, the same one that I used for Mr. Van Sleitman. It has all of his date of birth. All of his information is on here, his driver's license number. And does it, it indicates that it is the same intoxilizer that we were discussing previously? Yes. Okay. Um, so your observation period began at 317. Um, tell me about how the test is conducted. Um, I see the first item there is an air blank. What is that? Um, that first air blanket does, it takes a sample from the, just the ambient air that is surrounded by the intoxilizer, which should contain no alcohol, just in normal air. And it read for any alcohol present in the ambient air, and it read 000, zero, zero showing no alcohol present in the air, as it should have. Okay. Um, then the, the next one says cal check. What is that? That's a calibration check. The bubbling solution that I was talking about earlier that's on the back of the intoxilizer 5000 instrument, that alcohol is kept back there so that it can, the machine can use that as sort of like a, a control and a test that it should read at 0 .080. And during that calibration check, that is exactly what the machine read. You say it's supposed to read at 0 .080. Um, is, it, is it like exactly 0 .080 that it should show? Um, or is there a little bit of a range for the for the one one point zero zero one under or above but it read point zero eight zero exactly during this calibration check okay. uh, then after that I see another air blank what, what does that do what's the purpose of the second one that's just doing another air blank check and making sure that it's not reading any of the alcohol from before just ensuring that there's no alcohol present in the toxilizer instrument at that time and it at that time, at 3.51 a.m., that second air blank, there was no alcohol detected at all. What is the next entry? Uh, the next uh, entry that it had was the subject test sample. It's whenever I asked Mr. Van Sleitman to blow into the instrument to give his breath sample. And did he do so? Um, it took a few times he blew into the intoxilizer in the same manner that he was blowing into my PBT out on the road. And um, he was just giving a small short breath for about half a second. And the machine did not, did not recognize that as a sample at all. It, it, the machine still said, please blow until tone stops, until after I finally got him to give a sufficient sample. Did it at any point did the machine indicate to you that it had received an insufficient sample when he blew the first time? No, it had not registered on the machine at all. It still continued to say please blow until tone stops. And what was uh, what was the I'm sorry, can you repeat again the result of the subject test line, what Mr. Van Sleitman's alcohol concentration was? Yes, after he gave a long and big enough breath into the instrument, uh, it read of the alcohol content of 0 .087. And what time did he provide that sample? At 3.53 a.m. And what is the last line on the intoxilizer slip? It's another air blank. Uh, it's another air blank. Just checking to make sure that there was no excess alcohol that was being read from some other area other than his breath. And that read that air again at 0 .000. No objection. Without objection, uh, Mark is uh, Commonwealth's Exhibit 4 and entered evidence as Commonwealth's Exhibit 4. So there are, it seems like there are several, I guess, checks throughout the system, both from the machine and from yourself, um, to ensure that the test is performed accurately. Yes. Um, and uh, were there any problems at any point during this process that would lead you to believe that the test results were not valid? No, if there was a problem that went wrong with the machine, then it would have told me. It would have told me so, and I would have been looking for that, and I wouldn't want a mistake to go through. 
And all of the procedure for the test, for your observations, was all conducted according to um, policy regulations in your training? Yes. Did anything happen after uh, the test was performed? Um, did, you, did Mr. Ben Slatton speak with you? Did you make statements? Or did you just book him at the jail? Um, well, after he submitted to my, my test and signed that on the implied consent form, I, of course, asked him if that since he did all the tests that I wanted him to, if he wanted his own test. And he said no, and he signed the rest of the form. Um, I did not ask him any questions regarding the incident after that. I, um, there was no, there were no statements made that night about it. Um, I believe that's all the questions I have for this witness at this time. <clears throat> Mr. Foreman, you may ask. Thank you, Judge. Officer, you've stated that you've been on the police force at the time you pulled Joel over for about a month, just under a month. Is that right? I graduated from the academy in February. I've been, I was out of the academy for about a month, yes, about a month and a week. So you had a supervisor <laughs> with you at the time? I had a training officer present, yes. At the academy, did you receive, I believe, I don't remember if you are testified on direct, but did you receive any DUI specific training? Yes, there was 40 hours within the academy that was devoted strictly to DUI detection. 40 hours worth? Yes. You were taught how important it is to follow your training at the academy because a jury, a judge, a prosecutor will, would rely on it, right? Yes, sir. You were trained to write complete, detailed, and accurate reports? Yes. Citations, as we call them in Kentucky. Yes. Why is it important to make a complete record of everything that occurred during a stop? I put down the facts that I observe. Now, why is it important? So that we get the facts that we need. To document everything in the case? Yes. In this case, did you make a complete an accurate and full report. We do not make reports on DUIs unless there's class A misdemeanors within that. But I did not make a report, but I had my citation that I that I created that night. In the citation, did you note everything important that you saw? I I put the elements of the crime in the citation, yes. I fulfilled the elements. Anything important would be in the citation, correct? I can't put everything in there, but I put in facts that I observed. So if something is important, but you don't put in the citation, do you recall it from memory? I remember everything that I need to from that night. Do you remember everything from all of your cases, officer? No, I don't. But you remember everything about Joel crystal clear? From this night, I know what I observed. And you remember every little bit of what happened that night clearly. That's what you're testifying to today. Everything that I've documented, I, I have. So anything that is not in this citation, can you testify to that as well today? If there's something else, yes. So you do not have a complete citation here? I have the elements of the crime listed in that citation as I should. But you're telling the court today and the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is an incomplete citation. Judge and judge, this question's already been answered. I'll move on, Judge. We do not have a video recording for this case, do we? No. 
So we just have to rely on your testimony. You completed your training on February 13th of this year. Does that, does that sound right? Yes, that's the day I graduated from the academy. And Your Honor, if we could approach. Is it a certified it? copy? I don't see any certification on There's it. There's the signature. And it's electronic. And it's notarized. Okay. Well, I guess when I th think of a certified copy, I think of something that ha that is a copy that has been certified in some original way. And that's not an original signature. No, it is a, yes, it is a printed signature from an email or right. fax. Again, I don't recall. Here's my issue with it, Judge. The information on here. It's not something we typically see. The officer has said, I don't know what that is. If he doesn't have anyone that can explain the information in it to us, then I don't understand how he would ever be able to lay a foundation for it. It's a training that he went through. And the stuff on the second page is not something that makes sense looking at it. It needs some explanation. Are you saying it's inaccurate? No, I said it needs explanation, and you don't have that. I don't think I need an explanation. This is just a transcript. You're not going to have explanation on a transcript. On your college diploma, did you have an explanation for every class that you've taken, or does it say class and grade? Come on. Well, I think the problem becomes is that this is a copy of a document that has an original someplace. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, you know, if I were to go get court, court records, I would and there were copies of court records, I would get a certification from the clerk that would indicate that, I mean, you did, I guess, what you were supposed to do, Mr. Foreman. You asked for it, they sent it to you. Unfortunately, they didn't send you the original. And without the original, I, I don't think I can accept this. So. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Sustain the objection. Officer, do you recall when you completed the uh, breath test operator certification? Yes. When was that? That was in week nine of the academy. I cannot tell you what exact date that is, but it was in week nine of the academy. I believe it was in October. I can't tell you exactly when, though. At the academy, you use certain materials to learn from, is that right? In regards to? Field sobriety tests. Well, I'm talking specifically, I apologize, I should probably clarify the question, that was a terrible question. Um, during the 40 hours, I just want to focus on, zone in on the 40 hours of DUI training that you received, okay? okay. In those 40 hours, you guys spent time it's, it's a five-day course, eight, day, eight, eight hours per day for 40 hours. Is that right? Yes. You learned about how alcohol affects the brain of a person? Yes. How it affects the muscles? Just how it affects the body. How it affects the body, what to look for in a stop? Yes. You used the materials from the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. Not sure what those materials are. What, what are you asking exactly? What type of materials? The materials that you used during this stop were the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration manual from the year 2013. Is that right? Um, I'm not sure exactly what documents you're talking about. I, I learned the materials that they provided there for me. I'm not sure if that's what that is, but I learned materials and conducted the test in the way that I was trained. You learned how the body metabolizes alcohol. I know that it does. I'm not sure how. You didn't learn about it? I learned about it. I you don't remember? I can't say that I remember everything about it, but I know that the body does metabolize alcohol over time depending on 
the, your gender and your weight. At the academy, during those 40 hours, you'll learn how to perform and conduct field sobriety tests. Yes. The horizontal gaze and stagnus, the walk and turn, yes, sir. and the one leg stand. Yes, sir. And according to your training, these are the only three reliable tests to conduct. There's another part of the horizontal gaze and stagmus that isn't really used as a clue in the test, but the vertical nystagmus that I conducted that night, but I did not observe anything there. And the vertical gaze nystagmus would indicate extreme intoxication, would it not? It indicates if a person has more than what they normally do is typically what that is used for. You practice these tests, right? Yes. Do you have the instructions memorized? I know how to do them. I know the instructions of the walk and turn and the one leg stand just as I demonstrated them and the horizontal gaze nystagmus. Do you carry a card with you that has the instructions on a, on a little card in, in your pocket? I have one, but I really just do it from memory. So when you stopped Joel, and on a night of Joel's arrest, did you look at a card or did you work from memory? No, I just used my memory. Used your memory on all three tests? Yes. Could you please recite how to conduct a walk and turn step by step? Yes, would you like me to get up for? If you would, please. please. Have, have a seat, officer. I'm just talking about the walk and turn for now. Isn't it true that to pass the, the 40 hour instruction that you were trained under, you had to pass a test? Yes. And in order to pass that test, you had to get at least 80% on your, on your final. Yes. So 80% is a really, really good score for an officer. I don't remember what I scored. I believe it was far above that, but I know throughout the- But 80% is required to pass. Yes. That's all I'm asking. Yes. If a person is intoxicated, per your training officer, if a person is intoxicated, they will have alcohol in their brain. We discussed that. Alcohol right? or drugs. The alcohol will travel to the brain by the blood veins, correct? Yes, anywhere blood goes. Same with the muscles. Is that a yes? Yes, it, it affects the body. You are trained specifically that a person will have divided attention when they're impaired. That's the, yes, that's the idea of the psychophysical test. Is that a yes? Yes. 
So a person who is under the influence of alcohol will have divided attention. Under the influence of alcohol, yes. It's a simple yes or no, officer. Yes. If, if a person is under the influence of alcohol, will their attention be divided? Yes. Is it, is, that's the way you were trained, isn't that right? Yes. When you arrived on scene, you saw Joel speeding. Yes. You were on Dixie Highway, and he was coming from the overpass over onto Dixie. Yes, I, he came down the exit ramp and went south on Dixie. It requires better acuity to travel fast than to travel slow. Don't you agree, officer? Objection, Judge. I don't know that this is a question for this witness. I guess the question is, can a layperson answer that question? simple observation of a person who's under the influence would have less control over their vehicle than a, a person not under the influence. Speeding requires better acuity, okay, better control. That was the question. The question was, does a person have a, have, doesn't it require more control to go fast than to go slow? I think that was the question. I don't know that uh, the officer, I'll sustain the objection. I don't believe that the officer has the ability to answer that question. I'll move on, Judge. When you turn on your lights, indicating you're about to make a stop of Joel, he pulled over to the side of the road, correct? Yes. Using his turn signal while he did so? I don't recall if he used his turn signal or not in pulling over. Which would be consistent with the actions of a sober person, would they not? Using a turn signal. Overruled. I'll allow him to answer that question. Using a turn signal, I've seen intoxicated drivers do it, and I've seen sober drivers do it. You contacted Joel on the side of the, of the car when you approached him? Yes, right? the side. You said he had the hood covering his face? Yes, sir. And when you approach a subject, any subject, per your training, you are trained to divide their attention when you ask them questions. Is that right? I don't. I wouldn't say I particularly do that, no. You don't remember that in your training? No. Are you talking about during a traffic stop? During a traffic stop. Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. When you approach a individual on the side of the road during a traffic stop, okay, you are trained to divide their attention. That is your task. Because as we discussed, an individual who is under the influence would not be able to do so. Is that right? I don't try to divide their attention more. Whenever I'm on a traffic stop, I am concerned with keeping myself safe and just watching what they're doing. Were you trained to employ three questioning tactics? No, I've not heard that term. Asking two things simultaneously? Asking, interrupting, or distracting questions? No, I did not do that to him. Asking unusual questions? Sometimes, yes. So these are tactics you were trained under? Yes, yeah, so we try to, um, sometimes we use a little bit of, you know, just kind of a crazy question to see if they have like a humorous reaction to it or not, but no, that's not what I was doing here. So you only employed the unusual question technique in this case? Uh, I did not even do that. Was, you didn't use any of them? No. So you were not following your training? I was just gather, I was following the training in the instance that I was gathering the information and staying safe. You asked him for his license and registration, which he provided, right? And his proof of insurance. Proof of insurance, that's right. Did he produce both? He produced all that I asked him to. He did not fumble around with the documents. He simply took them out of his wallet and he handed them to you. Isn't that right? First, he was reaching around the car whenever I first got up before I asked him for the documents, whenever he still had his hood up. And first, I was concerned with I couldn't tell who he was, so I asked him to remove that. But he was just reaching all around the car while I was first asking him for his documents. When he got the license and the registration out, he did not fumble with them, did he? No. He did not drop them? No, just handed them to me. Which would be indicative of a person under the influence, as per your training. Is that right? Uh, no. 
we discussed that an, a person who is under the influence would have alcohol in their muscles. You were trained that if a person is under the influence, they will have difficulty and they would fumble around with simple documents such as license registration. Isn't that true? I've seen people do it, but I did not see him do that. Thank you. So during the initial contact, with the exception, I believe you mentioned that you smelled alcohol. An alcoholic beverage. Alcohol doesn't have a how can odor. You, how can you tell it's a beverage, um, officer? I just, I've smelled alcoholic beverages before, and that's what I detected coming from his breath. Aren't you specifically trained, per NHTSA, that you, an officer, or even a layperson, for that matter, cannot tell the difference as to what kind of alcohol was ingested by an individual? I, I or do you not recall that from your training? I just detected an alcoholic beverage on his breath. After you came back doing the, the license check, or uh, when you enter all the information to make sure it doesn't have outstanding warrants or um, any other prior offenses, et cetera, you came back to, to Joel's vehicle? Yes. And you asked him to exit the vehicle? Yes. He did not have any trouble doing that? No, he was complying with what I was asking him to do. He did not sway? No. He did not have any difficulty exiting the vehicle? No. He did not have, he did not lean on the vehicle or any other object for that matter? No. His face was not red or flushed? No. He was not slow to respond to any of your questions? He was speaking slowly and in a slurred manner. Have you ever had contact with Joel before prior to this night? No, I had not. Do you know his speaking patterns? No, I do not. Do you know how he speaks? Is that a no? No, I do not. Did he act in any unusual way? Yes, whenever I just, after I had him out of the car anyways, whenever I would just begin a sentence or begin to ask him a question or tell him about a test, he would immediately raise his hands up like, this just kept doing this re repetitively the entire time and I tried to explain to him it's it's okay I'm just asking you a question that's, that's all I'm doing but he kept putting his hands up he did not use any abusive language towards you no he did not he did not make any um, he, excuse me he did not have any bumps bruises scratches on him not that I observed no his clothing was not soiled did he tell you that he has just woken up no, he did not. He, he mentioned that in the suppression hearing, but not that night, no. He did not provide you with any incorrect information? Not that I, no, not that I detected. He or changed the answer to any of his questions? No. You then asked him first to strike that. You told him you're going to perform the horizontal gaze nystagmus test on him. Yes. Where was he standing? He was standing just in between, well, behind his car, in front of my car. Where was he facing? I usually have them face, I don't have them facing towards my lights. I have them face away and kind of diagonal so they're not getting their lights in my face. Sort of like if this was the front of my car right here, and this is the left side of my car, and his car is where you are, he was standing right there and facing. Like if this is the front of his face, he was facing like that. So he was not catching his lights in my eyes. The lights were not coming near his eyes at all. That's your testimony. They were hitting the side of his head. The side of his eyes. It, it, I made sure it was not hitting his eyes whenever I was looking at his eyes. Are you familiar with the term optic kinetic nystagmus? No. You were not trained about that term under NHTSA? Unless it's the same thing as resting nystagmus. It is not. 
Okay. Uh, I learned about resting nystagmus, which is one of the medical conditions I was telling you about, just that I was checking for. You're also trained that there could be many other causes of nystagmus, is that right? Yes, there can be multiple things. Tiredness being one of them? You were not trained that tiredness is one of the causes of nystagmus? No. Was Joel wearing glasses that night? No, he was not. Could you please, if you don't mind, officer, stand up and perform to the jury how you conducted the horizontal gaze and status test on that night? Begin, uh, I will tell you when to begin and when to, to stop, if you don't mind. Can you do it in the air? Okay. Without the explanation now, could you simply perform the test from start to finish as you did on that night yes. without commentary?
Have a seat. Thank you. Officer, you're trained as to what would happen if the stimulus is moved too fast during any of these tests. Uh, it can appear as a lack of smooth pursuit. If the stimulus, your finger or a light pen that you use that is moved too fast during the test, it would mess up the results of the test in plain language. Would it not? It could. On the citation, you noted that you observed four clues. Total between the three tests? Between the three tests. Oh, between. I observed four clues on HGN, two on walk and turn, and one on one leg stand. I had five clues. Oh, I'm, no, I'm adding wrong. Uh, four on HGN, two on walk and turn, and one on one leg stand. So you observed four clues on the HGN? Yes. You said two on the lack of smooth pursuit. Yes, sir. And two on the distinct and sustained nystagmus at maximum deviation. Yes. Where is that in your citation? Um, well, I put four clues because you will not see the onset of nystagmus prior to 45 degrees because before you see the others it you'll always see lack of smooth pursuit before you see the onset of nystagmus at maximum deviation before you see the onset prior to 45 degrees so that's how i know it's those because they're always in that order once again officer simple question where does it say distinct and sustained nystagmus and or smooth pursuit in your citation it doesn't say that. You then ask Joel to perform the walk and turn. Yes, after the HGM. You verbally instructed him as to what you expected him to do. Yes, and physically demonstrated it. And asked to make sure. But you never actually physically demonstrated to him on that night, officer, did you? Yes, I did. You never demonstrated the one leg stand either, did you? Yeah, I had demonstrated all the tests that I. You physically him. demonstrated the tests to him on that night. That's your testimony here today. Yes, I physically demonstrated the walk and turn as I did here. And I physically demonstrated the one leg stand. And I asked him if he understood the instructions. Could you please? And he that's, said yes. That's enough, officer. Could you Hold please? On. He gets to answer your question, so if you want him, if you have an objection to something that he is saying or don't believe it's responsive, you can ask me to do that, but it's my job to determine whether the witnesses should stop talking or not stop talking, not the attorneys. Thank you. Could you please stand up and perform the one leg stand for us? Yes. Have a seat.
you were trained that you're supposed to perform the walk and turn and the one leg stand on a level, dry, even surface. Yes, the best that we have available, the best we can make happen. But in this case, you were on the side of the road. Yes. Where there's gravel. I did not find any debris. Pre I, there was nothing present, but we were on pavement still, hard flat pavement. On Dixie Highway, the road is sloped at the end, is it not? Yes, at that area, there was a slight incline. So it's sloped? Yes. Uneven? Yes. Officer, would you agree that the items listed on the left are things that you're supposed to look for in a DUI stop? Let me read them real quick. Yes, those are each a clue. Are any missing, any clues missing from this list? Can't balance, starts too soon, stops during the test, touches heel toe, steps off line, use arm balance, proper turn, proper steps. No, all, they are all present. Joelle and Slightman was able to balance during the instructions. Yes. Did you testify to that? Yes. Didn't start too soon before you completed your instructions. No. You said that he stopped while walking on the ninth step. Yes. So how many times did he stop throughout the 18 steps? He stopped at the ninth step. One time. Yes, he showed one clue from stopping during the test. One clue. Yes, that that was one of the. Clues. I don't want to mark anything wrong. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. He stopped one time at the ninth step. That was your testimony. Is that right? Yes, he stopped one time. Throughout all 18 steps, he never missed the heel to toe. Correct. never stepped off the line? No. He never used his arms for balance? No. Kept his arms at his sides? Yes. You noted that, well, he didn't really have a turn, did he? He 
continued walking. Correct. He never made a turn. He took nine steps that way. And you said that he took a wrong number of steps, or did he take a correct number? He took the wrong number of steps because I instructed him to take nine steps that way and then complete his turn and take nine steps back. And he just made eight, 18 steps forward. He never made the did turn. Did he complete 18 steps or less than 18 steps? He made 18 steps, but in the wrong direction. But in the wrong direction? Nine in the wrong direction, yes. But it was still the correct number of steps? Four total, yes. So out of 93 possible clues on this test, you saw two. I go off of those clues. I have just those clues there that you list on the side. We don't look for how many times, really. Just what we go off of is if two clues are present on the test, then that's the 87% chance, or the 78% chance on the walk and turn probability that they are under the influence of alcohol we don't if one clue is shown multiple times we don't write it down we don't count it multiple times it's one clue even if they do it three times such as on the walk and turn whenever he showed my put his foot down twice for the three second mark that was still one clue so on the walk and turn based on the number of clues that are available minus the number of clues that you saw Joel scored a 97.84% on that test. I don't give a score. He, he showed two, clo two clues on the test out of eight. any of them are missing, please let me know. Counting properly is not a clue. We, we ask them to, but that is not a clue that we look for. It's just another thing for them to do during the test that we instruct them to. If they mess up their numbers, it's not a clue. So if they screw up their numbers, they start saying 1,005, 1,070, 1,032. That's not a clue. Correct. It's not a clue that we count. Did he follow your instructions during the, the instruction phase? Yes, he stayed where he was supposed to and held that position. With his feet together and his arms down on his sides, so I instructed. He didn't sway any th throughout the duration of the test, excuse me. He did not sway. No, he did not. He did not use arms to balance himself? No, he kept them down on his side. He didn't hop? No, he didn't. I believe you noted that he put his foot down twice before the three second mark. Yes. And you, I believe you said counting properly is not a clue? Correct. So we're going to strike that, change this, subtracting the not clue.
So based on the number of clues available, striking that last counting properly clue, which you're saying is not a clue, out of 121 possible clues during the 30-second one-leg stand test, you saw two, that he failed to keep his foot up and he touched the ground twice before the three-second mark, correct? He showed the one clue that I noted on there out of the six clues that we look for on the test. And per your training, one clue is not enough to fail a test, is that right? There's not really a pass or fail on our test. We just look for the clues and then just, you know, the probability that they would be under the influence of alcohol. There's not really a pass or fail for it. So out of 121 clues, subtracting the two that you did see, you did not see 119 clues. Therefore, Joel scored 98.34% on your test. I just looked for six clues. I didn't look for 121. I just looked for the six clues that I was trained to. You then made a decision that Joel failed your field sobriety test and you placed him under arrest. No, I made the decision that he showed enough clues that indicated he was under the influence and too impaired to be driving. And then that is whenever I placed him under arrest. And you arrested him? Yes. You transported him to the Ratcliffe Detention Center or Ratcliffe Police Department? Police Department. When you arrive at the jail, do you go through a sally port of some sort? Yes. Or at the police department, do you go through a sally port? No. Are there any cameras outside? Yes, there are. Do we have that video? But if we did, we would be able to see what Joel looked like, how he was walking, his mannerisms. I'm sure if you were able to get access to it, I, I don't have access to it. You don't have the video? No, I don't. In the Radcliffe Police Department, you sat Joel on a bench and handcuffed him to the bench, correct? Yes. Does the room where he's located, does that have a video camera? Squad room, no, there's no video camera. Or what about the intoxilizer room next door? Is that a camera? Is there a camera in there? I, I couldn't, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. At some point, you gave Joel a piece of paper to sign called the implied consent form. Yes, I read it to him and then asked him to make his choices on there and then sign where, whatever his choice was. You never actually read it to him on the night of his arrest, did you? No, I... Objection, Judge. The witness just testified to that in the sentence prior. I'll move on. He had him sign it? Yes, I, had, I read him each part and then had him sign each different question on there, whatever his choice was. And then you signed it at the bottom? Yes. You were moving in and out of the room during the course of the 33 minutes that you were supposed to observe, Joel? I moved from the squad room to the intoxilized room that are connected by an open doorway, but it's in line with the benches. I, I knew where he was the entire time. And they didn't have access to anything. You did not have visual contact with him the whole time, though, did you? No, I didn't, I didn't like, 
just look and stare at him for the whole time. No, I didn't. Did you walk out into the hallway? No, I didn't walk out into the hallway. Did you go get coffee? I don't drink coffee. Did you get yourself a different drink, a water maybe? No. You never went into the hallway, period? No, I did not. That's your testimony here today? Yes, it is. Officer, you're familiar with the, the Intoxilizer 5000 EN breath analysis operator's manual, are you not? Yes. Before you administer a test, you're supposed to have an individual under observation for at least 20 minutes. Yes. That is to make sure that they do not regurgitate, put anything in their mouth. And to make sure that the residual mouth alcohol it is absorbed into the mucous membranes by the time we take the test, so it's not getting alcohol just right up, sitting in their mouth still. Is that time to absorb? If a person were to burp or hiccup, you're supposed to note that on the citation. I asked him if he had anything in his mouth, and he told me no, but if he would have informed me, I would have, but he did not. You never asked him if he burped, did you? I asked him if there was anything in his mouth. Please answer the question, officer. No. Okay. You, never, you never asked him if he burped. Correct. You never asked him if he regurgitated. Correct. You never asked him if he hiccuped. Correct. You never asked him if he threw up. Correct. All of those things are required under your training, and you did not do them. Sorry, Correct? That's not a question. I think you'll probably need to phrase that in the form of a question. You made it more of a statement. These four things you were trained to ask. Correct? And you did not ask them? Correct. Before you administer a breathalyzer test, the machine goes through you talked about an internal check with the, the bubbling calibration solution, which is calibrated at 0.08. Yes. This internal check is to make sure that the machine is working properly. Yes. And before it does this calibration, it does an air blank. Yes, it starts with the air blank. That's the first step. Yes. Then it goes to the internal check to cal make sure the machine is calibrated at 0.08. Yes. Then it does another air blank. Yes? Yes. And then the subject is supposed to blow. Correct. Followed by another air blank. Yes. Those are supposed to happen one after another in sequence. Yes. Could we please, which exhibit is it? Conwell's, I'm showing you what has been entered as Conwell's Exhibit 4, the intoxilizer slip. Could you please read the times on the, starting with the air blank and ending with the final air blank? If you could just read line by line. Okay, the first air blank was at 3.50 a.m. and the calibration check was at 3.51 a.m. Then the second air blank was also at 3.51 a.m. And then the subject test was at 3.53 a.m. And then the air blank, the final air blank was at 3.53 a.m. So from the time that we had the last air blank before Joel blew, there was a two minute interval during which he attempted to submit a sample for you, correct? Yes. And you said that he blew more than once? Yes. It was about five to 15 seconds between blows. Is that right? Yes. How many times did he blow into this machine? 
counting the final one that took the sample out of, that was three to four times. And there were no air blanks between each try? Correct. You were trained during those 40 hours that you spent at the academy that the, the chemical test only provides presumptive evidence of alcohol intoxication, correct? Uh, not sure what you mean by presumptive evidence. It... Well, you were taught how to do field sobriety tests. Yes. What to observe for on the road. Yes. What to observe for on the driver. What to smell for. What to look for. So you don't just stop a driver, suspect him of the DUI, and drag him to the station for a test, right? Correct. I look at the totality of the circumstances of just everything together. So you're supposed to look for a lot of factors and then make your conclusion whether or not the individual was under the influence, correct? Correct. The test alone is not enough? Um, it's really that test is made after I've already made my decision. So. I've already charged the person with DUI before I use the intoxilizer. That's what those tests are for, so I can determine that. Do you have redirect? Uh... I have just a few short questions. It should take more than a minute or so. I'm sure that the jurors are probably ready for a break. And I promise it won't. If, if they're not, then I am. So <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and ask, though. Officer Bruce, the math, I don't know, the math that you saw on the report cards that Mr. Foreman held up, is that anything you have ever seen before? No, it's not what we use. use. No, we don't use that. Do you assign percentages to the test? Nope, just the, just the clues. So that math means nothing. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Mr. Foreman, anything else? No, that's all, Judge. All right. uh, thank you. You may step down. Uh, I think this would probably be a good take after lunch to go time to take our break. So uh, if you want to get, uh, I can't. Remember